week. The prize for physics was awarded today, chemistry tomorrow. Next, the directors of the two Nobel groups on the process of selecting winners. This one-hour event took place last month at the Commonwealth Club of California. At commonwealthclub.org for a complete listing of events. There are question cards on your seats for today's speakers, and these will be collected during the program. Please make sure that now all cell phones and beepers are turned off before we begin the program for radio. Please also bear with me as I repeat some of my remarks for the radio audience. Good afternoon and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California. Today's program is co-sponsored by the Consulates General of Norway and Sweden. I am Arde Jostein Norheim, Consul General of the Norwegian Consulate General in San Francisco and your chair for today. We also welcome our listeners on the radio and we welcome the viewers of C-SPAN TV. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speakers, Mr. Mikael Solman, Executive Director of the Nobel Foundation, and Dr. Gay Lundestad, Director of the Norwegian Nobel Institute, who will give us behind the scenes look at the awarding of the Nobel Prizes. It is important for me to first place in context the fact that Sweden and Norway were one country until the early part of the 20th century. This year marks the centennial anniversary of the peaceful dissolution of the Union between Norway and Sweden in 1905. And when they became two, they continued to cooperate in the spirit of Alfred Nobel, with Norway awarding the Nobel Peace Prize and Sweden awarding the Nobel Prizes in Physics, Chemistry, Literature, Medicine, and Economics. All of these awards take place each year on December 10th, the anniversary of Alfred Nobel's death. And now to our speakers. Mr. Mikael Solman is the Executive Director of the Nobel Foundation, located in Sweden, and he was appointed in May 1992. As mentioned, the Nobel Foundation bestows the prizes other than the Peace Prize. Mr. Solman was born in Stockholm. He holds a BA from the University of Uppsala and has done postgraduate studies at the universities of Uppsala and Stockholm. He has also served in numerous governmental positions in Sweden, including as Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and for Foreign Trade. He has also spent several years serving in the Swedish ministries of finance and industry. Mr. Solman is also a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and the Royal Swedish Academy of Engineering Sciences. Dr. Gerd Lundestam has been director of the Norwegian Nobel Institute in Oslo and secretary of the Norwegian Nobel Committee since 1990. As we said, the Norwegian Nobel Institute bestows the Nobel Peace Prize. Dr. Lundestad was born in Sulitjelma, a mining community in northern Norway. He received his MA in history from the University of Oslo in 1970 and PhD from the University of Tromsø in 1976. Dr. Lundestad has held positions at the University of Tromsø, including Associate Professor of History and Professor of American Civilization. He has also been a research fellow at Harvard University and at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. While being the director of the Nobel Institute, Dr. Lundestad is also a young professor of international history at the University of Oslo. 
And now it's my pleasure to welcome Mr. Mikhail Solman, who will be followed by Dr. Lundestam. Please, the floor is you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to, to um, be able to speak to this August um, gathering, uh, you here and all the, the others who will listen and view this, um, this, these presentations. Um, I, as uh, Consul General Norham mentioned, we are here because our uh, traveling exhibition is at the Exploratorium. And of course, on behalf of the Nobel Foundation and the no its Nobel Museum, we are particularly grateful to Consul General Barbara Osher, who has been absolutely decisively instrumental for, for uh, us being able to realize our, our goal to come to Exploratorium, the, the mother of, of all science centers. Now, <clears throat> the Nobel Prize is a phenomenon which has become an integral part of world culture during the 20th century. Indeed, as a notion, it's appearing in media and literature on literally speaking a daily basis, primarily, of course, uh, and very well merited so, with reference to the Nobel laureates. However, the background to the Nobel Prize, the workings of the Nobel Prize system, as it were, and the role it plays are less well known. The Nobel Prize was founded by Alfred Nobel who lived between 1833 and died in 1896, a Swedish inventor and entrepreneur who is in last will, which was written the year before his death, uh, established the, the foundations for, for the prize. The will was, from the financial point of view, based on the fortune Nobel accumulated, thanks to his invention of dynamite and to his participation in his brother's venture in Russian oil primarily. One third of his fortune was shares in Russian oil. And the will gives the grand design, the principles and criteria for what probably was the greatest of all his inventions. He registers no less than 355 patents. <clears throat> the price which carries his, uh, his name. And I think uh, the most efficient way is to read part of that will, because it's so clear. He says uh, the interest from, his, uh, from the capital should be used for five prices, which annually should be uh, distributed, uh, to those who, during the preceding year, shall have conferred the greatest benefit on mankind. The said interest should be divided into five equal parts, which shall be apportioned as follows. One part to the person who shall have made the most important discovery or invention within the field of physics. One part to the person who shall have made the most important chemical discovery or improvement. By the way, he himself made an improvement, not a discovery, because he, he improved nitroglycerin, uh, so it became handleable and then invented the, the, the two-step uh, explosive uh, process, which was revolutionary. Um, one part to the person who shall have made the most important discovery within the domain of physiology or medicine. One part to the person who shall have pr produced in the field of literature the most outstanding work in an ideal direction. And one part to the person who shall have done the most or the best work for fraternity between nations, for the abolition or reduction of standing armies, and for the holding and promotion of peace congresses. The prizes for physics and chemistry shall be awarded by the Swedish Academy of Sciences, that for physiology or medical works by the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, that for literature by the Academy in Stockholm, and that's the Swedish Academy he meant, and that for champions of, of peace by a committee of five persons to be elected by the Norwegian Stuting. And then comes the crucial phrase. It is my express wish that in awarding the prizes, no consideration whatever shall be given to the nationality of the candidates, but that the most worthy shall receive the prize, whether he be Scandinavian or not. And this phrase, of course, uh, is uh, one of the reasons why the Nobel Prize has the standing it has. The, the, the fundamentally cosmopolitan approach uh, to the prize. 
And the roots of uh, this whole design, the ideas behind, can be found in, in uh, Alfred Nobel's biography and in the values and the worldview he developed. Alfred Nobel's formative years and education were probably the most appropriate ones imaginable for the adoption of a cosmopolitan approach to life. He was born in Stockholm but grew up in a rich St. Petersburg where different nationalities and cultures mixed. This is where Alfred Nobel learned five languages fluently, discovered world literature, and mastered the fundamentals of mathematics, physics, and chemistry. His subsequent career took him to the United States and France, back to Stockholm, then on to Germany, Scotland, again France, where he acquired a permanent residence in Paris, then spent the last years of his life in San Remo, Italy. Asked where he lived, Nobel, who devoted a very large proportion of his time to business travel, replied that, quote, home is where I work and I work everywhere, unquote. We have a rather good knowledge of Nobel's interest in philosophy based not only on his ex extensive library, but also on the notes he wrote while reading the great philosophers from Plato and Aristotle onward. It's clear that he was particularly interested in the tradition of the Enlightenment with Spinoza, Descartes, and Voltaire as leading names. He was also inspired by Auguste Comte's uh, positivism. Politically, Alfred Nobel held quite radical views and was obviously influenced by his literary idol Shelley's cultural radicalism. Of the other great 19th century write writers who are richly represented in Nobel's library, Leo Tolstoy and Victor Hugo, with their idealism, pacifism, and social compassion, seem to have been closest to him. When Nobel's last will was opened, it initiated a three-year-long legal battle between the executors of the will and the Swedish branch of the Nobel family. Eventually, the Nobel Foundation was established in 1900, and in 1901, the first Nobel Prizes were awarded. I can add, speaking to an American audience, that uh, uh, Nobel had some, he, he, at the end of his life, he had factories in 20 countries, some 90 plus uh, production facilities, and he had business in the United States. However, he uh, acquired a uh, profound distaste for lawyers in general. Uh, and uh, that was one reason why there was a room for legal, legal uh, litigation around the, the last will. Uh, because he wrote it himself without consulting any, any lawyer. Now, since 1901, and increasingly so over the decades, the Nobel Prize has won the place as the supreme distinction of excellence in the Nobelian, quote-unquote, disciplines. In 1968, the Swedish Riksbank, the oldest central bank in the world, celebrated its tercentenary jubilee and instituted a prize in economic sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. When writing his will, Alfred Nobel had in mind that the prize should go to young scientists and researchers who, like himself once, were brilliant but short of funds to finance their work. However, in the scientific disciplines, the focus was from the very beginning put on, on fundamental scientific discoveries, even if technical inventions also figure among the prize citations. Often the question is raised, why is it that the Nobel Prize has acquired the standing and the prestige it enjoys today, given that a century ago there already existed a number of different prestigious national prizes in different countries? Most probably the explanation lies with several reasons. Well, uh, I, for the US public I can mention uh, the Benjamin Franklin Prize, which is considerably older than the Nobel Prize. Um, <clears throat> Well, one important factor was the internationalist cosmopolitan ideology behind the prize, embodied in the wording of the last will, which I just quoted, in awarding, etc. In this way, the Nobel Prize was the first truly international prize, and the, thus sent a forceful internationalist signal at a time when the tide of nationalism and chauvinism was rising. It was sometimes considered as a, as a kind of Olympic medal in the in the intellectual dimension. Another reason, valid at the time, and still not completely unimportant, is the magnitude of the price sum, 
approximately 1 million, well, today it's above uh, around 1.2, 1.3 million US dollars per price. And a century ago, when the price was launched, the price sum corresponded to some 15 annual salaries of a professor. Still another factor, and I consider that, of course, even more important, is the design, the depth and scope of the prize awarding process. It starts in September of the year before the awards by the committees of the prize awarders, sending letters of invitation to people all around the globe to nominate candidates. In addition to the group of people who ex officio, as it were, have the right to nominate. For example, uh, two gentlemen we have here today, two laureates, uh, um, Professor Bishop and Professor Avid Carlson, they are entitled to nominate because they are laureates. But on top of that, other specialists are uh, invited. And I can uh, uh, mention, for example, that the, the scientific committees, they send out some three to 4,000 letters of invitation to university, all, universities all around the world, and then varying that list of addresses over the years. The nominations, as well as the whole evaluation process, is classified for 50 years. Uh, but we know that the names on the shortlist tend to appear there for a number of years before leading to a final positive or negative outcome. And the announcements uh, are made in, in early October. The evaluation of the candidates is extensive and involves not only Swedish and Norwegian expertise, but importantly, importantly also international experts who are invited to give their analysis of the importance of a given invention or literary work or peace activity. In this way, the international character of the prize is strengthened. To illustrate the extent of this evaluation process, the Nobel Foundation, through the respective committees, spend an additional 60% of the sum of the prices on this work. Ultimately, it is the quality of the names on the list of Nobel laureates uh, <clears throat> which gives the, the price its standing. The success or lack of success of the prize awarding process is therefore defining the prestige of the prize. I should add another, still another factor, and that uh, is um, the, uh, the tradition. It's um, uh, as uh, uh, laureates are involved in nominating many of them before they become laureates, and, and a number of them after. There's a kind of apostolic succession. We know who nominated Einstein. We even know one person who wrote a letter to the committee to say, telling them not to give the prize to Einstein. And that was the first physics laureate uh, and inventor of the X-ray, uh, Röntgen. Anyway, there's this tradition, which of course reinforces the standing of the prize. Um, then we have uh, s uh, another uh, circumstance, and that is the very combination of the disciplines which are covered by the prize. Uh, Alfred Nobel's bringing together the scientific areas with literature, the other of the two cultures, um, and political involvement for peace conveys an ideological and philosophical message about what one should devote one's life to. A message with roots, of course, in the Enlightenment. But thereby, it also reinforces the standing of the different prices as being parts of a family of excellence. At the same time, the five Nobel Prizes and the Nobel Memorial Prize in economics have very different audiences. The Nobel Peace Prize is best known and receives widest attention, not least because every politically interested person is able to form her or his own view of the award decision but also because the peace prices often have been quite controversial, a necessary consequence of the persons and the substance they cover. In the first uh, third part of last century, the Nobel Prizes in Literature was heavily marked by the rather parochial conservatism of the members of the Swedish Academy, but has for over the years broadened its uh, intellectual horizon and today works with the global perspective not only geographically, but also in terms of styles and tendencies. And here I would like to, 
to welcome the fact that we have Professor Chell Estmark here, uh, slightly unforeseen. Uh, he has no place at the podium, but uh, he has promised me to give a brief uh, overview of, uh, of the history of, of the Literary Prize, which of course is uh, also interesting and very wide uh, public. Uh, Celeste Mark is, uh, as was said by Council Norheim, a uh, member and chairman of the Nobel Committee for Lit Literature within the Swedish Academy. But he is also uh, the main authority on, on the history of the Literary Prize, uh, thanks to his, uh, his uh, uh, books and writings. So in a moment I, I will give the floor to, to you, Chell. In the scientific disciplines, where the price citations sometimes are understandable only to the informed scientific community, much less controversy has arisen. And the general view is that, on the whole, the price awards have been successful in tracking the important trends and turning points in physics, chemistry, and, ph and physiology or medicine, as well as in economic sciences. And here I, uh, I uh, would like to refer to, to uh, what uh, Alfred Nobel said uh, when he was writing his will. He consulted with very few. It wasn't known uh, what intentions he had. But um, uh, he discussed the, the project with some collaborators. And they questioned, how come, how come you are... Uh, you intend to place this onus to find, uh, to find, uh, find these uh, uh, laureates in two small, at that time, rather peripheral and poor countries, uh, Sweden and Norway. And uh, his answer was, and it was quite typical of his uh, uh, skeptical uh, attitude to life, was that, you know, up there in the north, people ten tend to be least corrupt. And even if I'm um, not completely um, objective, uh, it would be very, very, very strange. Uh, I must say, I think uh, the committees have lived up to, to that, uh, that uh, characterization. Well, the primary and intended effect of the prize awards is, of course, to recognize and highlight important contributions and contributors to the benefit of mankind. Nowadays, many of the laureates are already well known in their particular sphere, but the Nobel Prize then projects an additional spotlight on their person and their work. In other cases, laureates who are, no are known only to a limited public are made better known, not least in other countries. The attention which meets the laureates is sometimes disturbing to their ordinary, normal life and work, and a number of laureates divide their life into before and after Nobel respectively. At the same time, the prize seems to give the laureates, as an indirect effect, a new platform and a number of laureates have been able to make use of their Nobelian standing in order to mobilize resources for different good causes, including their own research or, or new uh, directions of research. In a wider perspective, the prize contributes in its particular way to making room for science, culture, and quest for peace in the densely populated universe of media attention, at least once per year. And nowadays, with the potential of the internet, the information about Nobel Prizes is made avail available on uh, our very extensive Nobel uh, website, www. Well, it's actually not. Uh, it has been transformed is sim, it's in simply nobelprize.org. I can recommend you to visit that site. It's very, very uh, extensive, and uh, there are not only autobiographies, uh, the the main documents around the prize uh, winners, but also essays uh, and overviews, and importantly, educational. Uh, interactive plays which, uh, which illustrate uh, different uh, achievements of the, of the laureates. Um, well, judging from the, the constantly increasing number of visitors, last uh, year we had, uh, we had 20 million visitors. Uh, this is a, a, a very successful uh, venture, and we're very glad that uh, so many from the United States are visiting our, our site. And it's increasingly used in education, quite clear. Now, the Nobel Prize is, uh, is uh, 
a phenomenon which is based on the the values of, uh, of uh, the 18th century and uh, uh, technical positivism of, of the 19th century. And it's sometimes questions are asked whether this is, uh, we are not outmoded, but we uh, think we are quite successful and will continue and go on. Thank you very much. Uh, Yes, it will be. Mm, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and a great pleasure to me to be able to uh, talk a little about the literary prize. And I think the best use I can make of my minutes is to uh, clear up some fundamental misunderstandings about the literary prize. The first, I should say, is that this uh, full century's practice forms one uniform whole. As a matter of fact, Nobel history as to the literary prize falls into a number of, of chapters, each with its taste, its criteria, and so on. Uh, quite often, you don't realize that there's a, a continuous rejuvenation of the Swedish Academy, which means that the Academy, which gave the prize to Sully Prudhomme instead of Tolstoy, is quite another uh, Academy than the one that rewarded, let's say, T.S. Eliot and William Faulkner. I could illustrate this by one example. If you compare what happens in the 30s and in the 40s. In the, in the 30s, the uh, interpretation of the Nobel's will was that well, it should be to, for the benefit of the whole mankind. Then the addressee of the books in question should be whole mankind. They should be directed to the ordinary reader, should have universal relevance, as it was said. And then, accordingly, you find prices to Sinclair Lewis, Pearl Buck, etc. They even um, thought about Margaret Mitchell, gone with the wind. Now, in the 40s, there was a new generation which finished this excursion into popular taste and had another interpretation of the will. Still, it was the benefit of, the man of mankind, but like in the um, sciences, they thought that the laureates should be those who paved the way for new developments as to perspective and, uh, and uh, language. And uh, they, um, they thought they should start by Paul Valéry, the uh, great French poet, but he cheated them. He died in the summer of 45. So they began next year by the prize to Hermann Hesse, who had been rejected in the 30s. And they uh, went on by Andre Reid, T.S. Eliot, William Faulkner. It's a fine line, isn't it? And, uh, I think that the prize to William Faulkner was, to my taste, is the best ever in literature. Because at that time, he was not well known in his own country. And uh, what the Academy did at that time was to crown a pioneer in literature who was at the same time an, a great unknown master. And he had enormous consequences before for the following literature, you know, the, uh, the French uh, Nouveau Roman and the Latin American boom would have been inconceivable without Faulkner. Well, that is the first misunderstanding, that the, the uh, practice should form one uniform whole. There are new generations and new tastes all the time. The second great misunderstanding is that this prize is uh, political in a way. Quite often they say, for instance, just let me wash, oh yes, that's because of uh, what happened in Poland and so on. And this is completely wrong. Uh, one of the first aims of uh, the Swedish Academy is political integrity. I can illustrate that by uh, an example. When uh, Sartronitsyn was discussed, um, the, um, there was some 
they were, were afraid that he sh might have the same problems as Pasternak had. So the permanent secretary of the academy wrote a letter to his friend, the ambassador to Moscow, to ask if there was a personal risk for Solzhenitsyn. He got the answer, no, there isn't an answer which proved not to be prophetic. Anyway, um, the uh, ambassador added, Please do not give him this year, because that could be dangerous for the, for the relations with the Soviet Union. He got the answer. Yes, that might well be so, but we are convinced he is the best. Which means, in the first place, that uh, the Swedish Academy doesn't take any orders from the Foreign Office, and the government is quite happy not to have be blamed for what the Academy does. And at the same time, it illustrates the difference between political intention and political effects. There must not be uh, any political intention in the literary prize. But of course, an international prize always has effects. And in this case, they realized that it might be uh, some, there might be some difficulties in Swedish-Soviet relations, but they took the risk. The third great misunderstanding can be illustrated by uh, Professor George Steiner's long list of omissions. You know, why not Kafka? Why not Rilke? Why not D.S. Lawrence? Why not Musil? Why not Cavafy? Why not Pessoa? Etc., etc. And um, you, they don't reckon, uh, realize that many of these writers were dead by the time they were was published. What could you do about Kafka when his three great novels were published after his death? The same with, for instance, uh, um, let's say Proust. Uh, that's a great omission, isn't it? But uh, Proust got his notoriety in 1919 when the uh, second volume of his series, A la recherche du temps perdu, was um, praised by the, by the French Academy. But he died three years later and left half his series unpublished. So, I mean, if you look at such examples like Cavafy and Pessoa, their work was published posthumously. So I think if you, if you take a look at these three mistakes and see what has actually been done, I think it isn't that bad. Thank you. It's a great honor for me to be speaking here at the Commonwealth Club. And uh, very few are carried away by my presentations, but I tend to be carried away myself. <laughs> so uh, I consider it a blessing, and you in particular should consider it a blessing, that there is indeed a clock in the back of this room. Because Norwegian professors, we are programmed to speak for two times 45 minutes with a break in between, but today we'll skip the break. <laughs> When on October 7 of this year, the name of the Nobel Peace Prize laureate is announced in the main hall of the Norwegian Nobel Institute, the room will be full of journalists from all over the world. And the name will uh, be uh, broadcast to many countries and to many stations around the world. And then the reactions will come from presidents, from prime ministers, from leading newspapers, and some of them will say, what a wonderful choice, what an inspired choice you made this year. And others will say, well, these idiots in Oslo, they have done it again. I mean, who could possibly support such a choice? The great mystery to me, however, is that the world cares that the world is interested in the Nobel Peace Prize. Because there are hundreds of peace prizes in the world. We keep a list of some of these prizes, and we have identified more than 300. But if you have a wide definition of peace, I think you could easily argue that there are thousands of peace prizes in the world. And representatives 
from so many of these other prices, they have come to me and they all have the same question. How come everybody knows about you and nobody knows about us? Well, I have to give them the true answer, of course. It is that we have a committee of five internationally quite unknown Norwegians. <laughs> and you have juries of very, very prominent individuals. So now I think we will, be, we will see new committees being set up around the world with juries of rather unknown Norwegians, <laughs> hoping to copy our success. No, of course not. Uh, if you look in the Oxford Dictionary of Contemporary History, under Nobel Peace Prize, it will say, the world's most prestigious prize. Obviously, this is my favorite dictionary. <laughs> but I would like to discuss the question of why? Why does the Nobel Peace Prize uh, have this standing? And I think there are five uh, basic explanations for this. I mean, first, we have been awarding the Nobel Peace Prize for 104 years. As we heard, Alfred Nobel died in 86, 1896. It took uh, some years of legal battle until his will could be carried out, and the first prizes were awarded in 1901. So we've been in the market, I mean, we are in the country of the market, we have been in the market for a very long uh, time. Uh, secondly, we belong to a family of prizes, the Nobel family, and all members benefit from this family relationship. As we heard, uh, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize probably receives the most publicity of all the Nobel Prizes, but we in Oslo are extremely happy to be associated with the more scientific, the more objective prizes awarded uh, uh, in Stockholm. If we had been an independent prize in Oslo, well, maybe we would have had to go to Stockholm and ask the question, how come everybody knows about you and nobody knows about us? Thirdly, we claim not a perfect record, but a respectable one. We have made mistakes, uh, and it's easy to talk about the uh, mistakes of omission. There's one huge one. Mahatma Gandhi never received the Nobel Peace Prize. The committee had decided to award him the prize in 1948. Then um, uh, he was assassinated. He, under the statutes then in existence, he could still have been awarded the prize, but this was a huge complication, and no prize was awarded for 1948. One posthumous prize um, has been awarded to Doug Hammarskjöld in 1961, but then the statutes have been changed, uh, so it's not possible uh, to rectify uh, the mistake of Mahatma Gandhi. And I think that's, that's okay, because we should never, ever dream of uh, having a perfect record, whatever that might be. Uh, the Norwegian committee is a committee of uh, fallible human beings and we do make mistakes, and we will continue to make mistakes. Then uh, there are those who have received the Nobel Peace Prize who maybe shouldn't have. And if you consult the list, I'm sure you have your favorites. I have mine. But I, uh, I like my job. I think I will like my job for a few more years. <laughs> and we'll see what happens when I step down in a few years' time, uh, if I am able to... Uh, well, we have these uh, statutes which uh, limits your freedom of action, but we'll see what happens. Yes. But this is not the great mystery, that we have made these mistakes. It is very, very easy to make mistakes. What should be explained is the fact that we have made so few mistakes. And I think uh, in this connection, uh, certain underlying Norwegian and Scandinavian values uh, are important. Uh, our basic approach to foreign policy is dominated by a combination of idealism and realism, and this is just uh, the kind of blend uh, which we uh, should have as a basis for the uh, Nobel uh, Peace Prize. Twenty Americans have been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. That is by far the highest number. Three presidents, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Jimmy Carter, a number of secretaries of state, and many uh, uh, who do not belong in the more uh, official uh, tradition. Fourthly, uh, the definition of peace has evolved over time. 
We have included human rights, which is a very important uh, consideration. Uh, the price has become uh, truly global, uh, and we try to pay attention to uh, developments all over the world. We have to remember, constantly keep in mind, that more than half the world's population live in Asia. It took us too long to become global, but uh, since 1960, we would claim that we have been a very uh, global price. We have tried to identify more women, so that now uh, 12 women have received the Nobel Peace Prize. Not a particularly uh, strong record. Well, that is unless you compare it with the other Nobel Prizes. Then it's a very strong record. <laughs> then there are some who argue that uh, maybe the prestige of the prize has something to do with the monetary amount. And, and, and we heard about uh, this point of view. Uh, but then on the peace side, there is a price in America, uh, which had a, as its price amount uh, $10 uh, million, uh, but they uh, later reduced it to $1 million because they discovered that this was not uh, the big secret uh, indeed. And there is a price in Britain, which has it in its statutes that the price amount should at any one time be higher than the amount for the Nobel Prizes. Well, I think these are some of the explanations for the prestige uh, of the Nobel Peace Prize. And then, on October, uh, October 7, it's up to you. You can decide whether the Norwegians, these five unknown Norwegians, have again made an inspired choice, or whether these are these stupid Norwegians. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I am uh, Dr. J. Michael Bishop, a Nobel Laureate in Physiology or Medicine and Chancellor at the University of California, San Francisco, and I'll be moderating uh, the question period today. Let me just uh, thank once again Dr. Geir Lundestad, and, uh, Director of the Norwegian uh, Nobel Institute, and Mr. Mikhail Sulman, who's Director of the Nobel Foundation, uh, for their remarks. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to uh, before we go on, since it's been uh, quite a while since the program opened, let me just remind our radio and television audience that this is the Commonwealth Club of California, and our speakers today I have, I have just named. And our topic is the Nobel Prizes. How are they given? What is the response? Etc. Let me start with a little levity here. Um, there is no Nobel Prize in mathematics. And this has often puzzled people because mathematics is the underpinning of most natural science, quantitation. Uh, there's an urban myth that says that uh, Mr. Nobel left mathematics out of his prizes because uh, his wife had an affair with a mathematician. <laughs> this, of course, is false because he was never married. <laughs> there's another urban myth that it just had to do with a mathematician running off with uh, Nobel's lady friend. Now, we could spend an entire hour on Mr. Nobel's uh, two lady friends, but I would like to ask then, why is there no since it has nothing to do, as far as we can tell, with his amorous life, uh, why is there no prize in mathematics? Well, it, as you raised uh, that side of the, Alfred Nobel's uh, personality, it's uh, just uh, one can state that uh, if he was successful in many other areas, this was not one of them. Uh, uh, he actually had a long and very, very sort of tragic uh, relationship to uh, a Austrian lady who uh, we now know was five years older than she told him. Um, as for mathematics, it's very simple. We have actually tried to find, uh, we've very much looked into what evidence there should, would be for that and found absolutely nothing except that might, he might have uh, uh, had an argument with uh, Mitta Gleffler, who was a prominent uh, mathematician. But that person was at odds with absolutely everybody in Stockholm, so that was nothing special. Um, no, the, the simple reason is uh, there is no evidence for an active interest, personal interest, uh, uh, by Nobel for mathematics. He certainly was trained in math uh, in St. Petersburg, but uh, it didn't ever show any signs of interest for it. So that's uh, the simple Occam's razor for to that. Uh, a question that in some way relates to that is, what was the nature of the opposition to uh, 
uh, Alfred Einstein. Um, uh, I understand that even one member of the selection committee uh, opposed him vigorously. Uh, is it known why, why he was opposed? Well, uh, in general, uh, uh, the committees were not uh, convinced about his theory of relativity, and therefore uh, the, he did not uh, get it for the theory of relativity. There is even a very strange sort of uh, clause in the text there, say, without taking uh, position on his theory of relativity, they award the prize for the electromagnetic effect. But I think uh, um, Professor Svante Lindqvist, uh, Professor of History of Science and Technology and the head of the Nobel Museum, where there's an excellent exhibition on this issue, could add some, a couple of words, if you don't mind. That'd be fine. Thank you very much, but I think Mr. Solman has already given the answers. It's put me in a bit of a spot. Uh, uh, it's exactly that. There was no experimental evidence for, for, for uh, Einstein's theory of relativity. And the disclaimer that Mr. Solman mentioned is, 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 is a very interesting one. It's the only disclaimer ever in the history of the scientific Nobel Prizes. And uh, so he's given the prize for the photo uh, effect instead. Uh, and. Uh, after there were some experimental evidence for the theory of relativity, which came later. And uh, Nobel got, when Nobel got uh, mentioning of the Nobel Prize, he was on his way to Japan. And uh, he was told that he had received this prize and he should come to Stockholm. And uh, he said, well, I promised to give this tour of lectures. So I would not come to Stockholm. And uh, so he re received the prize three years later in the city of Gothenburg where the present location is now an amusement park, the Coney Island of Sweden, and Liseberg. And there he gave his Nobel lecture. And uh, it's reminded of Röntgen when he got the prize, the first prize ever awarded, the physics prize. He was told about this unknown prize from the north. And he said, ah, do I really have to go to the north? It's a, it's a problem for me. Uh, this disrupt my research, and worse than that, I would ask the chancellor for leave because I missed two of my undergraduate lectures. I really don't think I would like to go. Nowadays, when people like Chancellor Bishop receives this phone call, they very happily go to Stockholm. Thank you. <laughs> Even though there are only two hours of sunlight when you're there in December. <laughs> uh, one of the things that's of interest to the public, as well as the scientific community, is the limitation on number of recipients. Uh, in reality, Mr. Nobel's um, will allowed for only one per year, uh, and that got finessed up to three. And in this era, when physics certainly is often conducted by large teams, and increasingly the same is true in biology and chemistry, the question always arises, is it fair to hold it at three? So how did we get to three and why do we keep it there? Yes, sir. Well, this was part of the um, uh, laborious negotiations between the executors of the will of Alfred Nobel and the, the uh, Nobel family, where uh, the Russian branch under Emmanuel Nobel supported his uncle's will whereas the Swedish part was against. But there was a long discussion. Also, the price awarding institutions were, were reluctant to take upon themselves this, uh, this task. The only ones who immediately saw the, the, uh, the benefits of the whole uh, scheme were, was the, the Norwegian Storting. Uh, they accepted it. But in, this, um, in these discussions, negotiations, one uh, stated that um, the price should not be d divided into too many parts because there was this, uh, this uh, will to highlight somebody who really, really had made an important contribution. If, if you have an inflation of prices that divided into too many uh, parts, uh, it would be a, an inflation. Now, then uh, uh, the question of uh, um, huge groups making uh, uh, discoveries. Uh, there, uh, the overall statutes of the Nobel Foundation, who sort of finances and coordinates the system, including the Norwegian Nobel Institute, those statutes open up for, for uh, awarding uh, institutions, uh, legal persons, not only physical persons, uh, and that has been used. 
for example, the price to Kofi Annan and the UN, the same possibility is with the other price awarding institutions, but they, um, they have not enacted those changes in their own sub statutes. Uh, one reason is uh, I think they have uh, their hands full with the excellent uh, individuals already. So they don't uh, see, see that need, uh, actually. Uh, but uh, if it really becomes compelling, they can change, uh, they can change their statutes. I think I should add the, that, of course, Alfred Nobel's will is uh, crucial. It's very important. Uh, but we have to confess that we have sinned against this will on a few points. Uh, and the point on which we have sinned the most frequently is uh, the reference to the preceding year. I mean, it says in the will that uh, they should be awarded these prices on the basis of what they've done in the preceding year. I mean, that's, it goes without saying uh, that this is very, very difficult. It's impossible uh, to uh, adhere to. And then we have the modification, uh, uh, which uh, Mikhail Sulman mentioned, that uh, on the P side, we do include uh, organizations. Uh, so that's uh, uh, a special uh, practice we have uh, with regard to the peace price. Uh, the next question um, has to do with influence. How much has the Nobel Prize influenced the course of science? Can you give examples where the awarding of the prize affected acceptance of the science behind the prize? Now, actually, we were given an example in literature, uh, and I, an example I happen to agree with, uh, Mr. Faulkner. But what about science? What is the view of the foundation? Uh, uh, can you give us an example where you believe the prize has really had an impact on the acceptance of the science in question? Well, there are num uh, numerous examples of uh, trends being um, facilitated or opened. Uh, uh, and here, again, Svante Lindqvist is a much uh, greater authority on this. Uh, as a simple, humble economist, I can refer to Gary Becker, who spoke at Stanford this morning. Uh, who told me that his, um, his uh, direction of research uh, in uh, economics, which is in the, in the, uh, uh, on the frontier between pure economics and sociology, uh, for, well, mainly there, uh, was not at all as established as it later became after he got the prize. So uh, and there are numerous such examples. Uh, I, I think you would be uh, able to answer that question uh, <laughs> that much uh, better I, than I. Huh? I'll take the opportunity, uh, since it's some question as to whether economics is really a science. Uh, <laughs> the dismal science. Well, <laughs> Mr. Kane said that, not I. Uh, our own uh, Stanley Prusner. That's Prus why I said uh, humble economists. So. Yeah. Uh, our own Stanley Prusner at University of California, San Francisco, uh, received the prize at a time when his um, work suggesting that uh, a mere protein uh, rather than a more complex uh, replicating organism could cause disease. And the prize was given relatively early uh, in the discussion of that work and the efforts to replicate it. And there's no question that the prize uh, both emboldened uh, Professor Prusner and credentialed the work. Uh, towards its current widespread acceptance. I think that's probably one of the best examples in, in the last uh, decade or 15 years of credentialing by the prize. Uh, so some folks never care about the credentialing and they reject the prize. Who's done it and why? Well, um, uh, the, um, the voluntary rejection uh, <laughs> best known is uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who, um, who um, uh, actually, well, in those times, um, the, um, the system was not as tight as it is now. I'm very amazed that there are so few, uh, there are no leaks. During my 13 years, there have been no leaks uh, from the uh, prize committees, etc. But at that time, the system was not completely tight. And uh, he got uh, word about uh, him being uh, considered. And he wrote a very polite letter. Uh, saying that with all French uh, polite phrases, uh, but he would, would like to say in advance that uh, he was, would not accept the prize. Uh, well, uh, the Academy, in its august uh, considerations, uh, paid no attention to that letter and, and uh, awarded the prize to him, and he did not come and did not pick up the money. Now we have the more, uh, uh, the, the tragic uh, case uh, of Pasternak, who yes who you can see on photos, was absolutely happy getting the Nobel Prize, celebrating it, 
friends who never drank vodka, even drank vodka to his health at, at that party. And then you see him after being uh, steamrolled by, uh, by the totalitarian, totalitarian Soviet machine. And then he wrote a letter and said he couldn't re receive the prize. Uh, now that's uh, what I, I remember. Then, then you have... Um, you have the particular uh, circumstances. We're very proud. We have a good history of bad relations with dictatorships, uh, thanks, uh, thanks uh, to uh, not least to to the Peace Prize, but also to the, to the uh, uh, Literature Prize. And when Karl von Ossietzky in 1936 got the Peace Prize, a journalist who disclosed to the world the rearmament in Germany under Hitler, Hitler got crazy and. Uh, and introduced the law forbidding all Germans to receive the Nobel Prize, and introduced a prize of his own, Deutsches Nationalpreis für Wissenschaft und Kultur. Mm. And, uh, and there, but that did not influence uh, some of the scientific uh, committee, uh, committees uh, who uh, awarded prizes to Germans, but they could not receive it because of this German law. On the peace side, there is one who has declined the price. You may remember among the controversial prizes that in 1973, Henry Kissinger and Le Docteau mm. Uh, received uh, the Nobel Peace Prize for the Paris ceasefire agreement. De Docteau declined the prize. Henry had his doubts, but he did uh, accept the prize, although he did not come in person uh, to, uh, to accept it. And there are many who have not come to the prize ceremony because they were afraid uh, to leave their home countries. Andrei Sakharov, Lech Walesa, Aung San Suu Kyi are some examples. What's the most memorable Nobel acceptance speech uh, in your experiences? Well, I would say, uh, I don't know whether it's memorable, but the, the one I certainly remember is the one by Dalai Lama in 1989, because uh, he had given us a manuscript uh, about what he would be saying. And uh, of course, the television companies had received this manuscript, and they had provided the subtitles so everybody could follow his, uh, what he would be saying. Uh, the difficulty, of course, that um, uh, the Dalai Lama never ever came close to the, that manuscript <laughs> when he did deliver his uh, lecture. So I think this uh, caused a great deal of uh, confusion. And I'm sure that there were people all over the world who questioned their own uh, language skills because they couldn't uh, figure this one out. So uh, I don't think this was the best Nobel lecture ever given, uh, but in a way, it was the most memorable one. <laughs> Mr. Sulman, well, I mean. well, in, in, in Stockholm, we have a slightly different protocol. So we have the Nobel lecture separately from, from the award ceremony and the banquet. And, and so the laureates are forced, quote unquote, to, to, to both give a Nobel lecture, which is a real lecture along the styles of the Norwegian professors, 45 minutes at least, <laughs> uh, and uh, which then are reproduced in our official publications. But then also uh, uh, a banquet speech, uh, one for each discipline uh, in Stockholm. And uh, as I, um, I, I would hesitate to nominate the best uh, among those, but uh, what I can do is to refer you to nobelprize.org, where you <laughs> can read all of those, and there's some which uh, are absolutely fabulous uh, among the, uh, the banker speeches, uh, where, where the, the geniuses uh, develop their sense for humor uh, and, uh, and learning and, uh, and philosophy, etc. So this is an ad for, for that. Well, to continue the theme of William Faulkner, I think among academicians, Mr. Faulkner's address is considered one of the great Master for masterworks among Nobel lectures. It is great reading to this day, an extraordinary statement of principle. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, explain the economics prize to us. Uh, it's not really a Nobel <laughs> Prize, now, is it? It's not really a Nobel Prize. Well, <laughs> uh, the, um, the fact is that uh, in 1968, the Swedish Central Bank which, as I mentioned, is the oldest central bank in the world, were celebrating their, their uh, third centenary and uh, wanted uh, bang for the bucks. Uh, they uh, had huge celebrations in different directions, financing, research, etc. But they contacted the, uh, the Nobel Foundation and proposed this uh, uh, prize 
in, uh, in economic sciences in, uh, in memory of Alfred Nobel. And the then board of uh, the Nobel Foundation uh, accepted uh, this uh, under the condition that the Royal Academy of Sciences would take that on board, uh, which uh, they did. And uh, so the procedures are exactly the same. Uh, the rules for the nominations, the, there's a committee, prize awarding committee, uh, proposing to the General Assembly of the, the Royal Academy of Sciences based on nominations to the same uh, numbers as in the other, other sciences. So uh, it's, uh, it's an addition. We have, been got, we have got proposals for, from then Senator, later Vice President Gore to, uh, to add new prices for environmental efforts, uh, but we have uh, been very grateful for the idea but declined it. So it's, uh, it's like it is now and there will be no changes. Lest the audience think this is a trivial matter, I, I know one physicist at least who shall go unnamed who has declined to appear on the same podium uh, with a Nobel laureates, if I can use the term loosely, uh, in economics because he feels they're not genuinely peers. So there. <laughs> uh, it's just time for one more question, and uh, let me generalize a bit. Um, uh, Mr. Nobel, uh, uh, the will, as I recall, says that the, his hope in awarding these prizes was to uh, encourage or support dreamers because uh, dreamers have a hard time of it in society. Uh, that translates these days into individual recognition as you have discussed, but does the foundation see a larger social purpose in the prizes, for example, in science? I think that's obvious in peace, but can, can, do you see a larger purpose in awarding prizes of this extraordinary celebrity that extends beyond uh, something uh, just individual recognition? Well, uh, of course, the, the circumstances have changed dramatically over the 100 years when it com comes to sources of finance. And even if we're talking about $1 million, that's peanuts in today's world when it comes to supporting science. But uh, again, I think uh, still uh, we think the, the operation is useful in the sense that it, it concentrates the mind attention on, on, on individuals who are driving things and it helps to mobilize uh, not only attention but substantial, substantial resources in individual cases to, to uh, the development of activities in, in science and, and, and culture. Uh, and, and also in, 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 in peace, where it, it also plays a protective role. Uh, the names have been mentioned. So uh, I think we are uh, keeping the rules as they are, but uh, the practice by the committees, etc., adjust to, to the present world. Uh, so we, uh, we uh, intend to continue. I think we, uh, on the peace side, we have indeed included many dreamers. We have the politicians, we have the statesmen, we have the famous names we have all heard about. And then, every now and then, there will be some names very few have actually heard about. These are the dreamers. And we try to lift them up, and we put them on the world stage. And when we take some of these rather unknown names, I think we, we, we kind of, we almost gamble with people, because can they handle this? I mean, Rigoberta Menchu, the Indian uh, woman from Guatemala, 1992, uh, Shirin Ebadi, uh, 2003, uh, Vangari Matai, 2004, these are, they represent stories that should be told. We tell the stories and we provide them with a the microphone. They can then speak to the world and they can be heard. They are the dreamers. Well, let me thank uh, Dr. Gerhard Lunderstahl. Director of the Norwegian Nobel Institute, and Mr. Mikhail Sulman, Director of the Nobel Foundation, for joining us here today. Uh, we also thank you, the audience here, uh, as well as our audiences on radio and television. Today's program has been co-sponsored by the Consulates General of Norway and Sweden, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, commemorating over a century of enlightened discussion, is adjourned. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Your pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Comments. My work now is on the bottom. Thank you. 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 Thank you.